Doesn't make you feel welcome. Thank you. My name is Annie, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, and I always like to start with a passage from the big book because I, I honestly hate to chair meetings and sometimes it just goes horribly awry. So if it does, in fact, um, you've gotten one thing tonight that is definitely what works. Um, so this is from page 25 of the big book, uh, our basic text in the chapter, There is a Solution. And it says, there is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful, successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others, and we had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. When, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven, and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence, of which we had not even dreamed. The great fact is just this, and nothing less, that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do for ourselves, by ourselves. Whew, okay. So, my name is Annie and I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is November 5th of 2009. Um, I have a home group which is the Herndon Group 830 Monday nights at St. Tim's Church in Herndon, Virginia, which is about an hour east. Um, and I, I have a sponsor that I work the steps with, and I have the privilege of sponsoring young, other young ladies when they see fit to do so. Um, so my responsibility is to talk about my, my general experience, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. So what, what it was like was uh, I grew up with a very, I like to call it a vanilla childhood. Um, my parents are still together after 45 years this summer. Um, my dad is, is, was a successful colonel in the army. My mom is a nurse. My sister is also in the army, very successful herself. Um, I don't know of any other alcoholics in my family, you know, not, not my extended family. Um, and for those reasons, for a little while, I thought that I couldn't be an alcoholic. Like, I didn't have, I didn't have the, um, the mental or physical abuse. I didn't have a broken home. I didn't have alcoholics in my family. And so because I didn't have any of those excuses to drink, I, I didn't think that I could be an alcoholic. But I share those facts with you because it's really important to note that, like, it's still possible. You know, that was my experience anyway. So, um, like I said, totally vanilla childhood. I was given every opportunity in the world to succeed in life and uh, took it for granted. Um, I'd say everything was just fine until uh, I hit like puberty stage. I went to a private <clears throat> school up until eighth grade, and then I got moved to a public high school. And it was like all of a sudden the fear just set in. I was different from my fellows, and um, and I was awkward, and I didn't know how to talk to people, and so I got made fun of a lot, and I, I spent a lot of lunches in the bathroom crying, and you know, and and all that fear of just oh God, what do people think of me, and, and am I okay? I'm not okay. Um, and the first time that I ingested alcohol was like the biggest sigh of relief I had ever had. Um, I, I had heard, you know, people in my peer group kind of talking about alcohol. I had seen my sister drinking a few times. I had seen my cousins drinking a few times. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure I'd like to tell you that this is definitely my first drink, but it's this one or another experience. But this is the one that I remember. And this is... I went down to my, my parents' basement and I snuck a bottle of creme de menthe and I took a couple of sips and it burned going down. Creme de menthe is a very disgusting liqueur. Um, and uh, while I didn't get drunk that night, it did feel warm inside. And I went to a football game around a lot of people that used to make fun of me and I didn't care. And that was huge. And I felt funny and I felt relaxed and I <clears throat> felt a part of and uh, I knew that I would do anything to get that feeling as often as I could. And so, you know, I, I did. I, um, I, I just loved the effect produced by alcohol. And I noticed that I was kind of bodily different from my fellows because at the time I had finally settled into a group of girlfriends. And 
we would get together as girlfriends do in high school every weekend. And every weekend I would think, we have to get alcohol. It won't be fun unless we get alcohol. And all the girls were like, eh, if it doesn't come together, it doesn't come together, it'll still be a good time anyway. And I was the only one who was like, nope. Whose garage do we have to break into? What older person do we have to talk into this? What gas station do I have to sit in front of until somebody can go buy me alcohol? Um, and, and that was different from my friends, but I kind of brushed that off. And, and I would say that the whole thing kind of progressed the way that if you're an alcoholic, you know that it progressed. Um, it started with this occasional mental preoccupation of, man, it, Next time I get to drink, that's going to be awesome. I can't wait for the next time I get to drink. And by the end of my drinking, it was um, a mental obsession. I, I lived about four hours at a time because that's how long it took for stuff to wear off. Um, back to high school. I, uh, I got arrested once in high school. I had something in the high school that I wasn't supposed to have. And um, that time, I told myself, I'm just being a kid. All my friends are doing it because I surrounded myself with all the people that were like me. Um, I've got everything else in my life together. Someday I'll take care of it. Don't worry about me. I'll do your therapy or your rehab or whatever you want me to do, but don't worry about me. I'm fine. Um, and so, you know, it, it was then that I kind of learned as long as I keep everything together on the outside, you don't have any room to tell me what's going on. Like, what's not okay behind closed doors? You know, as long as, as long as I keep the grades up, as long as I don't get arrested, as long as I stay out of trouble, don't tell me what to do. Um, and so, part of that was keeping up my grades. Going to college was always just kind of a given in my family. Like I said, my parents gave me every opportunity to, su to succeed. And my, um, the only reason I wound up applying to college is because my probation officer was going to take some time off of my service commitment if I did. And so I did. And I got in. And my parents, again, were going to provide for me. And I thought, fine, I'll take your money. And I'll go four hours away. And I'll live the way that I want to live. Um, so I went to college. And I kept everything together on the outside mm -hmm. until I got arrested again. <clears throat> and this time... This time I was pretty sure that things were out of hand. You know, in addition to drinking, I had, I had basically fallen in love with anything that could make me feel different. And, um, and I would partake in that a lot. And so, you know, all my friends were drinking. Everyone in college is drinking. <laughs> not everyone is doing this other stuff that I was doing. And not everybody's getting arrested for all this other stuff that I was doing. But I was. And so they sent me to rehab, like an inpatient rehab this time. They wanted me to do four weeks. I was in control. I said, can't do four weeks. I can do two. I have a life to get back to. I have my plans. Um, but I'll do, I'll do your two weeks in rehab. And, and while I said all the right things, like, yep, you're right. I can't ingest any substances that alter my mood because I have a, an addictive personality. And, uh, and I won't do this stuff anymore. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, but on the inside, my thought was, Okay, this stuff is the thing that, that's causing all my problems. It's getting me arrested. It's kind of it's kind of taking over my whole day. It's taking over my whole bank account. But I'm too young to quit drinking. I'm 21 years old, and that is just too young to quit drinking. Um, so I'm going to go back to college after my two weeks in rehab, and I'm going to drink like the normal people on the weekends socially, and I'm never going to do this stuff ever again. And, uh, and I meant it. Because I knew that this stuff was kind of taking me down a path I didn't want to go. Um, and that thought, that reservation that I didn't talk to anybody about and I didn't take any action on had me drunk three hours after I got out of that rehab. And it's not like it was 8 o'clock on a Saturday night. It was 3 o'clock on a Tuesday, you know. Um, and, and as it was happening, I realized that, like, I wasn't in control of that decision. You know, I, I was, with all my heart, I meant that it wasn't going to happen again. And here I was, three hours after having made that, that big decision, and, and I didn't know how it happened. Um, so, again, though, I had this delusion that someday I was going to take care of it. You know, I, I would have told you at the time that I was an alcoholic and a drug addict, but, but, I'll t but the back of my mind was like, but I'll fix it. Trust me, I'll get it together. I'll get it together when I need to. And right now, I just don't see the immediate need. Um, 
And so I went back to college and I held everything together as best I could. And then I came up with a plan that was going to fix everything. As long as everything's okay on the outside, we're good. Um, and the plan was, okay, my parents only paid for undergraduate. Finish that. I'll go to graduate school because school's fun. It's not the real world. Um, you know, it, it, it'll make me successful. I didn't know how. I just figured master's degree equaled successful. Um, I don't know. And... Um, so I went back to my parents' house with the plan of saving up a whole bunch of money so that I could pay my way through graduate school and be successful. And it wound up almost two hours, two years later, uh, that I was still living in my parents' house. I had negative $724 in the bank. Um, I had lost my third waitressing job. I, the only friend that I had was somebody that I used to drink and use drugs with. Um, and I had tried for as long as I could to not keep living that way, and every day I failed. Um, a little bit of what that looked like, you know, the book says we had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we just couldn't, we couldn't act on them. And, um, like, my parents are real good people, and they raised me with good morals and good values. Things like, you don't lie to people, you stand up and you look them in the eye and you tell them the truth. You don't steal from people. You work hard to earn what you have. Um, you don't hurt other people. You, you help them, you lift them up. They taught me all those things, and I did the exact opposite. Um, I, I was a thief. I was definitely a liar. After that first stint in rehab where I only did the two weeks, um, you know, it kind of came out that Annie has a problem, right? And that's not good. So. Not only did I have to hide my, my abuse, but I also had to play the role of like a recovering alcoholic at the same time. So it wasn't just, I gotta hold everything together on the outside and keep my stuff behind closed doors. It was keep your stuff behind closed doors, hold everything up on the outside, and act like you're in recovery. And like, that's a whole lot of, that's a whole lot of stuff to be spinning. Um, so like I said, I was a liar and a thief. And I tried, legitimately tried everything I could think of to stop living that way. I, um, everything the big book talks about, taking a vacation, not taking a vacation. And by vacation, I mean like going away with people that would pay for it because I didn't have any money. So like going away, not going away, not drinking before a certain time, only drinking socially. You know, like I, I tried all these things. I tried therapists, I tried medications, I tried everything I thought could possibly work to not have to live the way that I was living four hours at a time. And, um, and none of it had worked. And every day I wanted it to be different and every day I woke up with a mental obsession and could only live four hours at a time. Um, so here I was in this, in this trapped cycle. And um, through some snooping of my sister that I have later, later forgiven her for, um, my parents found out that I was not a recovering alcoholic anymore. I was an active alcoholic. And they confronted me and they said, um, okay, so either either you go to rehab or you don't live here anymore. And, you know, they had confronted me about a hundred things a thousand times. And every time they had in the past, I could get out of it. I could come up with a lie. I could twist it around on them. They loved me so much they wanted to believe it, and I knew it, and I took advantage of that. Literally every time. Our bank, card, our bank account card is missing, and there's been $500 withdrawn from the bank. Do you know anything about that? Oh, my God. This guy was going to steal my dog, and he held it ransom, and I had to have the money. And I just know I couldn't tell you because you just let the dog go, so I had to do it. You know, and, like, I got by on that one. I don't know how, but I did. And... So this is me. Anyway, so the last time they confronted me, this last time, you need to go to rehab or you get out. Um, something in me didn't want to fight anymore. <coughs> and it was like that sigh of relief all over again. Except this time it was like, maybe things can be different this time. Like maybe I don't have to keep living the way that I'm living. So... Um, they, they hooked me up with a bit of a rehab, and 
they only had room in a week. I had to wait a week before I went in. And in that time, my mom said, don't get arrested and don't die. Because those two things were very real possibilities at the time. And I'm kind of making this point for me instead of you. Because when I don't tell my story for a little while, I kind of forget just how bad it was. And my mind starts telling me that it's not that bad. But when you're about to go to rehab and your mom tells you don't get arrested and don't die, and those two things are, are a little difficult to accomplish in a week, like that's, that's a problem. Um, so they sent me to rehab. And I had this like overwhelming sense of hope. Like things... You know, maybe my life can be different. And I got there and I saw the 12 steps on the wall. And I had been to AA meetings before because I had been playing like I was a recovered, recovered person. And I saw God in the steps. And um, I had previously said, plenty of people get sober without God. Maybe I'm one of them because I don't think I really believe in all that. Um, I had been a science major in college. I considered myself a scientist and kind of an atheist. I'd grown up with a, with a conception of God that I had really wanted to throw out, and I did. Um, but I had this great counselor who said, okay, so you believe in science. You believe that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And I said, oh, yeah, totally, because that's one of Newton's laws, and I can totally get behind that. And she said, okay, so some people will call it karma, but can you just believe that... Um, Whatever you put out into the universe has a greater likelihood of returning to you. As in, if I increase the positive energy in the universe, I have a higher statistical likelihood of encountering positive energy. And if I increase the negative energy in the universe, I have a higher statistically probable chance of encountering negative energy. Boiled even further down, if I smile at someone, I'm more likely to get a smile back than if I complain to someone, I'm more likely to get complained back. Um, and that was just a principle that I could really get behind. You know, that was like a really simple way that, that something outside of my control, but like with my 1%, could change my life for the better. Um, and, and that was the little mustard seed of hope that I needed to just make a start. So God bless her. Um, and then you know, I had this hope and I was going around rehab smiling at everybody and annoying everybody because in rehab you don't really feel like smiling. And, um, and it got to be about two or three weeks in and all of a sudden I realized, okay, this is great. I got a little start. I've got all the alcohol and drugs out of my system. I'm feeling pretty good about life. I'm about to go back to my parents' house in a 10 by 10 room that I've built for myself with no friends and no acquaintances. No activities or hobbies, no life other than the life that I was living when I got here, and I'm terrified because I don't know what a sober life looks like. And it was like that day that my counselor came to me again and she said, we found a halfway house for you in a different state, but you would have to go straight there. You can't go home first. And that was the first, that was the start of my third step, which was, you know, uh, man, I've really screwed myself up. I think I can accept that other people might know better for me than I do right now. So maybe I should take their advice and just go to this halfway house. And that's what I did. Um, and I was like totally pink clouded, you know, like I was like, recovery, I'm going to get a blockbuster. We're going to like watch movies on Saturday night instead of getting wasted. And it's going to be awesome. Um, and they sent me to this halfway house that was actually quite strict. I've, I've heard of some Oxford houses that are pretty loose, but mine was like, you wake up at 7 you read your daily meditation as a group, you make your bed, you do your chore, you get out of the house by a certain time, you go find a job, you do two meetings a day, you get a sponsor, you're, you're not allowed back in the house until five, you cook dinner for the house, you know, it was a very strict regimen, and thank God, like, they taught me how to live. I didn't know how to budget money, I was given, like, $15 a week, and I smoked at the time, and so I learned how to smoke, like, $3 Grand Prix, I think they were, um, and, like, I learned, I just learned what a life on a daily basis looks like when you're not obsessed with drugs and alcohol the entire time, you know? And I just learned how to interact with society, and I learned... And I know that not everybody has this opportunity, but it was absolutely necessary for me because I was just dumbfounded. I was like, how do people go about their daily life without being obsessed with drugs and alcohol? So, um, in this halfway house, it required you to get a sponsor, get a home group, work the steps. I found a sponsor, I started working the steps, I took every suggestion that was given to me, and then I felt really comfortable around four months, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to take every suggestion. Like this whole thing about don't move out of the halfway house with somebody that you met in the halfway house, 
I think I'll be okay. This girl and I both have four months, which is a long time. And so I think that we're going to be okay. And so I moved to like a completely different city that I wasn't familiar with, with this girl that I had just met four months ago. Um, and surprise, surprise, she relapsed. And it, luckily we had built in a deal that if either one of us relapsed, they needed to get out and continue to pay the rent through the end of the lease. Um, and so she left. But here I was in a new town that I wasn't that familiar with, um, without much of a network, and um, four months sober without having done a fourth step. Like I had worked one through three with my sponsor. And, um, and that was difficult, which is why they kind of tell you to take suggestion, because if you don't take suggestions, sometimes you get put in a hard spot. Um, but I did find a home group, and the beautiful thing about it was that I went into this young people's meeting. I hear that this is a young people's meeting. Love that. Um, young people's meeting was my home group for three years, and then on the night that I signed up, somebody came up to me and said, here's a key to the church. Show up at 7.30 next week and make the coffee. And I did. And, like, when he handed me that key, like, I used to break into people's houses and steal their stuff. And I wanted to be like, do you know that I used to break into people's houses and steal stuff? But, like, probably not the wisest decision. But I'm so glad that he did because I made coffee at that meeting for two years. And um, showing up at 7.30 for an 8.30 meeting, I got to know everybody that came to that meeting regularly and everybody that didn't. You know, I, I got to know the faces that made it my home. It's the best job in the world for, for a new person starting out. Or an old person, I don't know. Um, so I got a sponsor. And uh, I worked through the steps. Let's see how much time do I have. About a half an hour. I worked through all the steps. And the first time I worked through all the steps, I did them like they were a ch uh, list checking exercise. Um, the fourth step I sat on for a little while because it was like, you guys know, anybody that's done it, it feels like this big daunting task because everybody makes a big deal out of it. Like, you have to be thorough. And as a perfectionist, I was always like, how can I be completely thorough? I don't know. Like, so I sat on it for a little while until like all the pain just built up. Like, it really does. Like, once you know that it's there, once you know that all that crap is there and you decide not to look at it for a while, like, it kind of just keeps growing on you and growing on you and growing on you until you just can't handle it anymore and you either drink or you do it. Um, that's my experience. Um, and luckily I did it. It was like, no big deal. Like, I went to do the fifth step with my sponsor, and after I was all done, like, pouring out my heart and soul, she was like, that sounds like a pretty difficult four step. Like, you don't have anything a little bit more spicy? And I didn't. Like, I was regular. I was normal. I was right-sized. Um, I did the fifth step. I went home. I took the 45 minutes. It says to take an hour. I took 45 minutes. Um, I worked six and seven with my sponsor at the time. I made a list of the amends that I had to make. I made some amends. Like I said, I was a thief, so there were quite a few financial amends on my list, uh, as well as family amends to my parents and my sister. Uh, I, I did a little bit of work on 10 and 11 and then I jumped right into 12 and I started sponsoring people kind of on accident because at my home group there was this girl who just kept showing up and every week she was very quiet she didn't really talk to anybody and I knew that because I was there an hour every, every an hour early every week um, and every week I would just chat her up because she wasn't talking to anybody and every week I'd ask her if she had a sponsor and eventually she was just like will you be my sponsor um, and I had asked my sponsor and she said yes, thank God, because I worked with that girl and it gave me a whole new understanding of the steps. Um, and so, I've definitely made some mistakes along the way. I got into a relationship in sobriety in the first year, which is really not recommended, but I thought that I was ready for it. And I was not. Um, and, and I don't recommend it to girls, but I, I do not hold it against them if they make that mistake as well. Because I learned a lot of lessons. Um, Along the way, over the years, I, I wouldn't say that I worked 1 through 12 straight through for a while, but I did do things like I would go to step meetings. I love step meetings. And um, when I got to the third step originally, it says the wording is, of course, quite optional so long as we express it without reservation. And when I saw that, like, I was like, great, because all the these, that, and nows really don't work for me. So I'm just going to rewrite it in my own words. My basic third step prayer was like, God, help me because I can't take it, take it away from me. Uh, and I said that for years. And then I was in a third step meeting, and somebody read the third step aloud, and I realized that I was missing a large chunk of it. Um, 
Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help of thy love, thy power, thy way of life. Like, the whole point of the third step was so that I might be taken out of my own self enough to show other people that I might be of service to, that God has done these awesome things for my life. And then I realized that, like, I was supposed to be a walking example of the big book. And when I honestly took a look at my life, how I had been living it, like, what if tomorrow the people I'm working with found out that I was in AA? Would they think that AA was, like, a really awesome, upstanding program? Or would they think that, like, AA has a bunch of a-holes in it? And I was like, probably closer to the a-hole, right? Um, and that, like, that wasn't okay. That was a big revelation for me. Like, I need to start, I need to start living as an example of what has actually been done for me. You know, like, what God's done for me. Because my life had completely changed by then already. Um... And then um, I got to, I was like at a seventh step meeting or something, and somebody read the seventh step prayer, which I had been saying in my own words again. And it says, um, I'm willing that you now should take all of me, good and bad, and remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Um, I had just been asking God to take the bad stuff. I made a list of what I found unacceptable, and I was like, God, take away this, take away that. And um, less so, like, the, the emphasis on you can have my whole self and just give me back what I need to be of service. Because, again, the main point here is to be of service. Um, and for, like, forever, I feel like I just thought that this whole process was to, like, give me my life back and, and make me happy and put me where I wanted to be in life. And it was a big revelation for me several years into sobriety that um, in the end, this whole thing is not about me. It's about making me of maximum service to the people around me. Like, God wants me to be good to his kids. Um, and then again, I was reading through the ninth step with the sponsee. And it got to this one part that was like, remember, we are, we are suiting ourselves to be of maximum service to the people around us. Like, amends aren't to make me feel better. Amends are to, to help try and heal the people that I've hurt along the way, if I can. Sometimes I get a harm. Um, so again, it was, just this, it was just this journey that didn't happen all in that first run through, 1 through 12. And so um, I did want to share just a couple, couple of recent things. So um, I was 24 when I got sober. I got sober in a young people's group. I got sober in young people's AA. And like because I came to AA with zero life, I had built no life for myself. No friends, no job, no money, no connections, you know, no possessions. Um, I started from the bottom up and AA gave me a life. And so AA became my life, which was awesome. Like I had all the time in the world. I had a waitressing job again, which I managed to hold on to. Um, and on my nights off, I would go to meetings. And at the meetings, I would talk to newcomers, and I would pick up people, and I would meet them for coffee. I would go to the Starbucks before the meeting, and I would go to the diner after the meeting. Um, I, you know, I met people during the day when I could. I just, AA was my whole life, and, and I just surrounded myself with it, which is really what I needed at the time. And because I did that, uh, I met a wonderful man in sobriety, a man of character, and we got married. And about... And I moved down to Virginia from Baltimore, where I got sober. So I got sober in Baltimore, and I moved down to Virginia. And um, Virginia AA was not done right, <laughs> um, in my humble opinion. You know, when, when you're raised in a certain type of, on a certain style, and then you move to a completely different area where things are just done a little bit differently, um, it really threw me off. And I was like, Goldilocks and the Three Bears with AA. Okay, wait, this meeting is to this. This meeting is to that. They talk too much here. You know, it's... So I'm just going to go back to Baltimore all the time. And that's what I did. I drove back to Baltimore two to three times a week for, for meetings where I felt at home. And I did that for like a year and a half. Um, and then I got pregnant and, um, like, slowly wasn't able to make it back to Baltimore very much. Tried to make meetings in Virginia work, but really started drifting away. Had the baby. Definitely couldn't drive to Baltimore all the time. Um, and I just felt 
apart from again. Um, I I don't think that I was making a real attempt to connect to other women because I had this preconceived notion of you know these guys don't care about the steps and I need somebody serious and I, I wasn't I wasn't looking hard enough and so I didn't find what I needed. And I felt really disconnected. And finally, I was just desperate enough that I started speaking up in every meeting that I went to. So a big part of the boundary, I guess this um, was in Baltimore, it is hammered into your head that you take the cotton, cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. You don't share unless you're called upon. Sharing and volunteering in a meeting is ego. Like, keep your mouth shut. And in the, the area that I'm in, in Virginia, the whole theory is you volunteer in a meeting and that's how people get to know you. Like, that's how... That's how you open up to other people. That's how you share. Um, and I didn't share for like ever because I still had this thing in my head, a preconceived idea. Um, and it was, it was keeping me apart from people because nobody got to know me. I would try and chat up people after the meeting, but it really wasn't the same thing. So I started opening my mouth, and at every meeting I went to, I just shared honestly. Like, I'm kind of in a hard spot. I really need women. I really need to connect. I'm not okay. And... Um, and AA pulled through, and I ended up getting introduced to a new sponsor uh, who was like real hardcore on the steps, and we're going through them again, 1 through 12. I'm on my fourth step again, and um, I've, I've done inventory along the way. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Like I've, I've inventoried resentments along the way. I've made amends along the way, um, but I was really excited to start this fourth step because rather than like what I initially thought it was way back when of like this, let's find out what a piece of crap Annie is. You know, like what are all the bad, horrible, um, disgusting things that I've done? And I have to actually tell another person how awful I am and yada, yada, yada. I, I don't look at the fourth step like that anymore. I look at the fourth step, maybe it's because I haven't done anything as despicable as I did when I was using, but um, I, I look at it as like this fact finding, like curiosity mission, right? Like, what does drive me today? What, why do I have the reactions to life that I have? And maybe they can be different, you know, because I don't like how I react to some things. So I'm really excited. I'm about halfway through it. I've, I've done the two columns, and man, there's a lot. Um, but it, it's been really good, and it's been really necessary, and I held out a little longer than I would have liked on it. But also... My life can't look like it did when I first got sober. Like I said, I didn't have a life when I first got sober, so AA became my life. Um, today I have a child to care for. We're going to have another baby in January. I have a husband in the program who also needs to get to meetings and has two ch a child and a half. You know, I, we, I have to help him get to his meetings too. Um, and for a little while I completely wrote off like, I can't help anybody. I can't go to a meeting every night. I can't pick people up and drive them to me. I don't have that kind of time, you know, so I kind of just didn't try at all. And I'm slowly easing back into, I can, I can fill in, you know. People can come over while the baby's napping. Um, I can get a little hour, an extra hour before or after the meeting with the babysitter. Like, I can make it work. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a difficult journey. So, as far as some, some real effects that the program has had in my life, um, something that's been pertinent lately is my sister. Um, and I've told this story once before, and I felt like the message got lost. Um, if you're new, working the 12 steps all the way through the first time around relieves the mental obsession. That was the biggest effect that I felt. Um, it didn't have to, it didn't wait until 12. It happened somewhere in the middle. But um, just... Following the motions and going through the steps and working with a sponsor, somewhere along the line, the mental obsession over drugs and alcohol was lifted. And um, I haven't had that compulsion to drink since I got sober, thank God. Um, and so that's what, that's what they practically did for me the first time around. That's what taking all these suggestions did was I, I haven't had to take a drink or a drug in, in over six years. Um, but the program has done so much more for my life than that. Like, it's not just about not drinking. Um, I had to make amends. I worked at a, at a pool on this campus where my dad worked. And like I said, I was a thief. And I was kind of a creative thief because God help me if I ever got caught. So I had to be, like, really sneaky about it and never get caught. 
Um, so I worked at this pool, and I staged a break-in where I, like, I was the person to lock up. They didn't have any cameras. And so I, like, I, like knocked down a door and did some other things and made it look like somebody had broken in after I had left and stole the money out of the cash register. And uh, it came time to make amends for that. And I went to my sponsor, and I said, man, i gotta go, got to go walk into this office and pay this money back and fess up to having staged this robbery that everybody kind of thought was me, but they didn't have any proof. Um, and she said, have you talked to your dad about that? And I said, oh, no. He'll probably be pretty upset. And she said, yeah, you think that that might hurt his reputation at the campus? And I was like, oh, probably. I hadn't even thought about it. She was like, yeah, part of the amends process is except when to do so would injure them or others. So it's really up to your dad what that amends look like. Um, like my dad is like army. Stoic, like when you have conversations, he need, he doesn't look at you. He like stares straight straight ahead because he don't like to make eye contact in emotional situations. Um, and so that was like terrifying. And she was like, "Well, you're just gonna have to have that conversation with him." And so we were going on a beach vacation, the family, and um, she said, "Okay, talk to him at some point while you're there." I really didn't want to, and I didn't know how I was gonna get a chance to talk to him alone. And I just prayed on the way there. I said, God, if it's your will that I should have this conversation with him, and give me an opportunity and make it known. And um, day three into the trip or something, it's kind of rainy, kind of misty. And my dad announces to the family, like, I'm going to go take a walk down to the beach to see what's going on. Anybody else want to go? And nobody in the house volunteered. And it was my time. You know, I, I volunteered and I went. And um, again, we were walking, so we got to stare straight ahead instead of, in each other's eyes, um, and I, you know, I got to explain to him, hey, so I stole this money from the pool where you work, and I need to pay it back. It's part of the process. I need to make amends for it. Um, so it's kind of up to you how that happens. Um, and he said, oh, well, can you just write an anonymous letter or something? It's like, if that's what you want, I can do it. I can also go in there and hand it to, straight to them. I could write a letter or I could don donate it somewhere else completely. And he was like, why don't you just write an, an anonymous letter? Just send it, if you have to do it, just send it in, make it anonymous. And so I said, okay, whatever you want. And it didn't feel done. Um, I had made amends to my parents, but the first time around was in my first year of sobriety. And looking back, it was really an ego-based thing. It was really like, look guys, I'm okay now. Like, I did it, I'm okay. And uh, that's not what amends are about. So uh, it felt undone. And I said, um, you know, Dad, I know that it was really hard for a really long time, and that was my fault. And so if there's anything that I could ever do to make it up to you, just let me know, and I'll do it. And he said, well, you know, Annie, we just want you to be happy. And we just, we just want you to have a good life. And um, because he's awesome. My parents are cool like that. And I, t I went back home and I told my sponsor what happened and she said, okay, they want, they want you to be happy. They want to know that you're happy. They want to know that you have a good life. So you have to start filling them in on it. You got to call them all the time. You got to tell them what you're up to. You got to share the ups. You got to share the downs. Um, make them a part of your life. And so I did that. And then, man, yeah, I love my parents. Uh, we were on another beach vacation. And let me tell you this, I used to hate my sister for a long time. Um, I would have told you that if I wasn't related to her, I wouldn't choose to know her because I didn't like her. She annoyed me. Uh, we were nothing alike, like oil and water. I resented a lot of things about her personality um, and I just, I wanted nothing to do with it. And she always made it kind of known that she did want a relationship with me and I pushed her away. So we're on this other beach vacation, like another year. And it just felt the whole time like it was me against the world. And Katie, my sister, was the ringleader. You know, it just felt like she was getting everybody to gang up on me and making me the problem when she was obviously the one being the troublemaker. Um, it, it just felt like everybody was against me and it was her fault. And my husband and I dropped her off at her door after that vacation. And the second she got out of the car, he said, you know, you really could be nicer to your sister. And I lost it. I was punching the dashboard. I was screaming. 
I, he says that he's never seen me like that. I'm sure I've never been like that in my life. But I couldn't have been more angry. And, um, and I called my sponsor after that and I said, things are not okay. I didn't realize how not okay they were until I lost it in the car with my husband. What is going on? And she said, it looks like you need to do another inventory on your resentment against your sister. So I did some writing on it. And what I came to was um, that I resented her for never being the sister, for not being the sister that I thought I deserved, the sister that I expected to have growing up. She didn't protect me coming into high school. Her reputation hurt my reputation. Um, she, she never wanted to include me in anything growing up. Like She was just a mean older sister. I really hated her for it. And so in exchange of her not meeting my expectations, I drove her away as soon as she did want a relationship. You know, I held her, I held her arm's length. I used her for money. Um, I, I wasn't very good. I wasn't a good sister. And, um, and and she she went away to the army. She served two terms in Afghanistan, and I had a lot of guilt for holding her so far away during that time because it's a hard time, and you need family, and I wasn't there. So anyway, my I went over it with my sponsor, and I was determined that I needed to make another amends, and I scheduled a lunch with her. And waited until the very, thank you, waited until the very end of the lunch because that's what I do with amends. I really hate making them. And I have to go into them like, God help me, God help me, God help me, God help me, because I just don't, you know, you just don't want to do it. And so I waited until the tech came and I said, you know, hey, um, I really wasn't a very good sister to you when you needed it. And I'm really sorry for that. And I'd like to make it up to you if I can. So if there's anything I can do to make up for it, let me know. And um, she said, yeah, you know, I wasn't a very good sister to you either. And in that moment, I wanted to be like, ha-ha, you know, like, no, you weren't. <laughs> um, because I didn't expect it to be said. And I was like, yes, that's the whole reason. Um, but in the big book, it specifically says... Putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done, we stick to, to our wrongdoings. Um, and so we don't bring up the faults of others during these amends. And so I didn't address that. But she said, you know, okay, I, I wasn't a very good sister to you either. And I just want you to know that I'm here. And I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I said, okay, there you are. Um, and I left. And she, she had moved close by by then. She was in Alexandria. And she knew that I was in AA, and she had been to a few meetings just to see what it was all about. And she knew that I had close people in AA. She knew that I had people that I trusted and I talked to, and I, I filled in on all my stuff in AA. And she wanted to be one of them. And so one day I was having this hard time with something. You know how we do. Something comes up, some struggle, and you have to start calling your network. And I called my sponsor, and I called my best friend, and I called this other lady, and they all didn't answer. And I was like, I could call my sister. But she doesn't know I am. She probably won't be able to give me anything like useful. But I might as well just call her. And so I called her and I filled in on what was going on with me. And I don't remember her saying anything particularly helpful. But I felt glad that I did it. Um, and then the next time I did it again. And then I did it again. And, uh, and I started calling her a little bit more regularly. And she would call me and I would answer. And I would just fill her in on what was going on with me. Um, and before I knew it, she was maid of honor in my wedding. Um, and now she is just a tremendous aunt to my little girl. And she recently had to move to Kansas because she's in the Army. And I missed her. And that's amazing. Um, and she, she had a hard time. Her stuff wasn't coming out. And she felt lonely because I know that she gets lonely. And I spent a lot of money on a plane ticket to go see her. <laughs> um, and it's been really amazing for me lately because when I think about the relationship that I would have missed out on had I stayed in that, that belief that she had harmed me and she wasn't worth knowing. Um, and, and I can tell you for sure, she did not change over, over that time. She didn't become a different person. I did. You know, my perception of the whole situation changed. My, my outlook on, like... Like I read in the beginning, you know, I had a complete shift 
in the way that I approached life. And because of that, I was able to fully appreciate this relationship that was right in front of me all along. And I, I would have, I would have passed by. Um, so it's really beautiful. And it's because of that. It's because of this recent experience that I've had, the recent experiences that I've had in, in amends and taking a look at like where I've really been wrong and where my perceptions might be wrong. And I've been so excited about this recent fourth step. Um, and the way that my sponsor is having me do it is uh, a little bit different than I've ever done it. It's a lot of writing. But technically it's the way that it's outlined in the big book, which is every person gets assigned a number, and then every person gets their individual resentments listed, which means that mom gets 1A, 1B, 1C. Dad gets 1A, 2A, 2B, 2C. Um, and when I listed out all the resentments that I had when I really looked inside myself, it got up to like 145. <laughs> and um, if you haven't done a real thorough inventory, that might sound like a really big number to you. Luckily, my sponsor had told me ahead of time that her last inventory was 200. And so I was like, yeah, I got nothing. Um, but the funny part about it, and I, I'm able to say it in this meeting, and I probably wouldn't have last week, but what, as soon as I finished the, um, the fourth step, I went to go text my sponsor, like, 145 on the books, ready for the next column. And I accidentally sent that text to a group text that she had sent previously, which was, like, a couple of my sponsorship sisters and, like, a couple other random people. And for a split second, I was embarrassed. And then I was like, whatever. Like, my sponsor came back with, it's a wee program, right? Like, um, and I can say that out loud because, like, it's not good for me to claim to be perfect. 